Two more minutes and we'll start. Okay, folks. Welcome, welcome. Good morning. And uh, if you can, if you get a chance, if you can turn your cameras on, I'd appreciate it because it's easier for me to talk to people than it is to talk to gray boxes. Okay. It's ten thirty in the morning. You should be dressed and out of bed, I would assume. But even if you're in bed, if you're as long as you're in pajamas, I don't care. Um, okay. I hope you had a good long weekend to catch up on things. And if you are. This session, I'm going to talk about ways of estimating the equity risk premium. Before I do that, though, let me start by going back over what we were setting up. Remember, the end game here is you want a hurdle rate for a company, right? And the hurdle rate has to be estimated based on the riskiness of a project. And we went through that process of figuring out how to estimate risk. We went through the CAPM and we talked about the characteristics of a good risk and return model. And I said, I was going to focus on the CAPM in spite of all of its limitations, because everything I say about the CAPM, you can say about any risk and return model. And I three inputs I need to get from the CAPM to a hurdle rate for a company. I need a risk rate. I need an equity risk premium, and I need a measure of relative risk of beta. We talked about risk free rates last session. Let me make sure that that got nailed down. You guys are all in the first gallery, so I'm sorry if I keep picking on you, but I, you know, I'll, I'll try to move across because there are only 48 faces I can see at a time. Jake, remind me again how I get a risk free rate. If I asked you, what is the risk free rate? What's the first question you need to ask before you can answer that? Uh, what country are we working with? What currency, right? What country currency? is kind of yep. messy, right? Currency. The reason countries and currencies don't always go together. Yep. Hey, remember, you're in the EU, you could be in Greece, you could be in Spain, what currency? And the risk-free rates in some currencies are easier than others. If you have a AAA rated entity, like you do in the US, you do in Switzerland, you do in the Euro with Germany, you can just use the government bond rate as a risk-free rate. If not, you have some work to do, right? Daniel? What is the work you need to do? If I give you, gave you, asked you to get a risk-free rate in Indonesian rupiah, what is the process by which I would estimate a risk-free rate in rupiah? Um, you'd have to decide um, what the default spread is, and you could use. You'd have to estimate, right? Decide is it suggests that you can make a choice. You have to estimate it based on the rating of the country or a sovereign CDS spread, and subtract it from the government bond rate. Why? Because the government bond rate includes a default spread. You want to clean up for it. So you can get a risk-free rate in a currency. And then we talked about equity risk premiums. If you remember, I said the equity risk premium is driven by the risk aversion of investors, which can change over time, and how risky they perceive the world to be, which can also change over time. Think of how much it changed in that first quarter of 2020 as events kind of unfolded that were out of our control which means risk premiums should be dynamic. So today I want to talk about how to estimate the equity risk premium. I'm going to take you through three ways of doing it. And I'm going to latch on to one of them and I'm going to talk about why. Broadly speaking, there are three ways you can estimate an equity risk premium for a country. The first is to ask people. And after all, if the risk premium is what you need to make over and above the risk free rate, why not go around asking investors, how much do you need to make? How much do you need to make on stocks to break even? Very similar to the question I asked you in the last session. Remember, towards the end, I said, if you have everything invested in something risk-free at 3%, how much more would I need to offer you? So called survey premiums. 
we'll talk about how they're estimated and why nobody uses them, what the dangers of those are. The second, which is the most broadly used approach in computing cost of equity around the world, is to look backwards. Compute what's called a historical risk premium. Sounds fancy, but here's what you do. You look at the last 50 years or the last 100 years, you look at what you'd have made investing in stocks over that period, and then investing in something risk-free, in the US that could be treasuries, and then take the difference. It's historical because you're getting it from the past and you're using it as your premium for the future. I'll talk about why people like it and why I don't, why I don't think it's a great way of estimating risk premiums. The third approach, which is something I've been pushing for almost 30 years, is a forward-looking premium. Sounds fancy, but I'm gonna estimate an equity risk premium based on what you pay for stock. Sounds you know, mysterious, but I'll come back and explain how what you pay gives away your equity risk premium. It's called an implied premium. So let's start with survey premiums first. Now, if you decide to do a survey premium, first you've got to decide which subset of investors you're going to survey. You see why it has to be a subset? Why can't you ask every investor? Like 50, 100 million of them? How the heck would you even do it? You send out an email to every person on the face of the earth saying, send me your premium back. You'd probably go into junk email boxes all over the world. So survey premiums pick a subset. And there are different subsets that have been picked. The Securities Industries Association used to poll individual investors. And here's what they would ask them. What do you think the stock market will do over the next year? Give me a percentage return. They stopped doing it in 2004 because it dis they discovered it was almost pointless. Because what they were getting were not expectations, but hopes. Do you know what I mean by that? People would be asked, what do you think the market would do? And people say, I'd like it to do 20%. So I'm going to say 20%. You can say whatever you want. It's a survey. The second is Merrill has been, has been surveying institutional investors, much smaller subset, clearly controlling a lot more money. And they do it, I think, every quarter. And their number, the 4.8% the, the, the you see there for 2013, barely budges over time. Institutional investors seem to be a very inertia-bound bunch. They give you the same number. Campbell Harvey and John Graham would teach at Duke do a survey of CFOs, a very different universe, right? You're asking CFOs, in your companies, what are you using as an equity risk premium to come up with hurdle rates? And they've been updating that number off and on. You can get the most updated number on my website. 
Uh, Professor, I believe you're still on mute. Can you still see my screen or do I have to re let me reshare? Yep, we're because good, we're good. Okay. So in probably the most useless survey of all, let me make sure I'm recording as well. So things, things are all. Okay, so in perhaps the most useless survey of all, Pablo also surveys you know, academics on what they're teaching in classes. Do you see why it's useless, right? Ultimately, when you think about equity risk premiums and you think about coming up with an equity risk premium for the market, it's a weighted average, weighted by not how much enthusiasm you showed when you told me what your equity risk premium was, but by how much money you bring to the table. Now, do you see why polling academics is kind of useless? I mean, how much money do you think collectively academics bring to the table? But I guess they have an outsized influence. But here's the bottom line. You have all these surveys going on. Nobody uses them. You think, why not? First, they tend to be, you know, you can give unreasonable answers in a survey because you can say whatever you want. I think the market's going to go up 25%. Nobody's going to constrain you. Second, they're more reflective of the past than the predictors of the future. In other words, you come off a really good decade for stocks, you tend to give a high number. You come up a really bad decade, you give a low number. And even the very best, best surveys go only one year. Nobody wants to give a five-year forecast. So survey premiums might look good, but nobody uses them. Let me take that back. There's one area where people used to use survey premiums, which is in real estate, where pe well, real estate developers were surveyed on cap rates, which is their measure of what the expected return should be. CBRE, which is a service that, that kind of aggregates them and reports them is still out there. It seems to be the only business where pe people use survey premiums because it tends to be a small homogeneous group of people that you're asking. So it's a survey premium. Let's talk about historical premiums. Historical premiums are the choice of most analysts, most appraisers in how to come up with an equity risk premium. So here's how it works. You define a time period, 10 years, 50 years, 90 years. You calculate the average return you'd have made investing in stocks over that period. Then you calculate the average return you'd have made investing in treasury bills or T-bonds over the period. Then you take the difference. So let's say over the last 50 years, you'd have made 7% investing in stocks. 3% investing in T-bonds, seven minus three is 4%. You're done, it's a historical premium. Sounds good, right? But when you use a historical premium, here's what you're assuming, whether you like it or not. First, you're assuming that that historical premium is a good estimate, a solid, precise estimate of what you'd have earned over the last 50 years. You're saying, what's wrong with that? You're gonna see when I compute averages that they're not that precise. Second, you're assuming mean reversion. You know what mean reversion means? Basically, mean reversion essentially assumes that you're going to revert back to the way things used to be before the last 50 years, the last 100 years. I'm going to argue that both those assumptions are shaky. But before I do that, let me show you the historical premiums for U.S. equities going back in time. Notice the word that I use, premiums, plural. So here's what I did. And this is actually on my website. I'll send you the link to the data set. You can play statistics on your own, play money more. I have data on stocks, US Treasury bills, US Treasury bonds going back to 1928. That's 94 years of data. Sounds like a lot of data, right? I've computed the historical premiums and I've computed 12 different numbers as the premium, ranging from 4 to 13%. You're saying, how can they be so different? First, it depends on what slice of history I look at. I could go all the way back to 1928. I could go back 50 years or I could go back 10 years. I get very different premiums. Second, it depends on whether you use T-bills, which are short term, less than a year, or T-bonds, which can go up to 10 or 30 years. I get different premiums. Third, it even depends on how I compute the average. If you give me 94 years of returns, I can take the 94 years, add them up and divide by 94. That's called an arithmetic average. Or I can look at the compounded return you could have made over time, which is what would a dollar invested in 1928 be worth today? And what would my compounded, it's a geometric average. I get different numbers. So which one should I use? I'll give you the short answer. They're all crappy, but some are crappier than others. 
Remember in statistics, when you compute an average across 90 or 95 numbers, you're trained to put in brackets below it, your standard error. What does it tell the world? That's how uncertain I'm about, about this average. See these numbers in italics? Those are the standard errors in my estimate. So when I tell you the historical risk premium going back to 1928 is 5.06%, which is the geometric average over T-bonds. Why T-bonds? Because as we said in last session, our risk-free rates in corporate finance are long-term rates. I'm sticking with the T-bond. Why geometric averages? Because these premiums get built into a discount rate, which then is used to discount cash flows in year one, year two, year three, which is a compounding of the discount rate. So if you, if you nail me down, so you got to pick one number here, I'm going to say 5.06%. And then I'm going to say, by the way, before you use it, here's what I need to tell you. Truth in advertising requires me to reveal that that 5.06% premium comes with a standard error of of 2.15%. You remember enough statistics to draw on that. Basically, that means my true risk premium, if you do go plus or minus two standard errors, could be less than 1%. That's 5.06% minus two times 2.15% to all the way to almost nine and a half percent. Fat lot of good that tells you to tell you that the equity risk premium in the US could be anywhere from one to nine and a half percent. Do you see why I don't even want to go to the 50 or definitely not the 10 years? With a 10-year premium, look at the standard error. It's almost all noise. A 10-year risk premium in equity markets is almost useless as an estimate because there's so much noise in stock returns. So if you have to pick a historical risk premium, go back as far in time as you can. Make it over the risk-free rate you're using, T-bonds, and use a geometric average, but then hope and pray that you're somewhere in the range that's reasonable. I don't want to hope and pray. I don't like historical premiums. 90% of people use the CAPM, use historical premiums. I don't like it because it's backward looking and noisy. And there is a selection bias. And here's the selection bias. You know what the most successful equity market in the 20th century was? It was the US. What are we doing here? We're computing what you'd have earned as a premium on the most successful equity market. And we're using it as a premium for the next 50 years. You see the danger in this? You have no idea what the most successful market in the 21st century will be. Using US historical risk premiums as your basis for computing equity risk premiums in other markets is extremely dicey because of that selection bias. So I'm going to give you my alternative to historical risk premiums. And it's not complicated. Remember in foundations, some of you, uh, uh, I don't know whether any of you are taking foundations in conjunction with this class, but if you've taken foundations or if you've opted out of it because you took a finance class, remember how we compute year to maturity on a bond? Niharika, you nodded your head. So I'm gonna put you on the spot. How do you compute the year to maturity in a bond? I don't remember the exact formula. But... I'll help you here. You have a price of a bond. You got the coupons and the face value. What is the yield to maturity? Um, so it's price minus. Uh, so. Yeah, it's I'm going to throw you another lifeline. You try a discount rate on the coupons and the face value. Discount them back. You're going to get a value, right? What do you want the value to be when you use that discount rate yield to maturity? You want it to be equal to the bond price. In other words, it's that discount rate. It's an IRR for a bond. Remember IRRs from you know way back? It's that discount rate that makes the present value of the cash flows in the bond equal to the price of the bond. That's what a yield to maturity is. It's a forward-looking number. Every time the price of the bond changes, the yield to maturity will change. I'm going to take that and apply it to stocks. How can you do that? A stock is not a bond. I know. But I'm going to make it look like a bond. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to take what you paid for stocks. I'm going to take you back to November of 2013. And I'll tell you what this, I'll, and I'll give you an update on what that number looks like today. In November of 2013, the S&P 500 was trading at 1,756.54. Everyone with me so far? You go and buy the entire index. When you buy the S&P 500 index, you know what you're getting, right? You're getting the 500 largest market cap stocks in the US. So you bought them. 
what are the cash flows you can expect hope to get on those stocks? I mean, you don't get a coupon on stocks, but what do you get instead? Anybody? Go ahead, Chandan. Dividends. And in the US, increasingly buybacks, right? Because you own stocks. I mean, lots of companies. Are I can't tell you what they will be in the future, but I can tell you what they were in the 12 months leading into November of 2013. Dividends and buybacks would have been about 82.35. So here's what I know. I know what you paid for stocks. I know what the cash flow was last year. There's one final piece to the puzzle. Normally you buy stocks because you think earnings and cash flows will grow. You don't know at what rate. But the S&P is the most tracked and followed index in the world. And analysts who were tracking the S&P 500 at this, in November of 2013 were estimating a growth rate of 5.59%. You see where I'm going to go next, right? I take the 82.35. I grow it at 5.59% to get the cash flows for the next five years. So instead of coupons, I've got expected cash flows. And unlike a bond, which has a finite maturity, what's the maturity date for stocks? There's none. They can go and go. They can go on forever. So here's what I do to capture the fact that they can go on forever. I assume that beyond year five, the cash flows will continue to grow at the risk-free rate. Yes, and why the risk-free rate? The risk-free rate is actually a good proxy for the nominal growth rate in the economy. It's got an inflation rate embedded in it and a real interest rate. So it's something you're going to see me use over and over as my growth rate in perpetuity. That growth rate is 2.55%. So here's the equation. Here's what you paid. Here are the cash flows for the next five years, 86.96, 91.82, 96.65. And beyond year five, these cash flows continue to grow at 2.55% a year forever. It's kind of a preview of valuation when we get to it. I solve for the discount rate. Let me back up. Solving that equation is an incredible mathematical mess. It's trial and error. Thank God for Excel's go seek or solve a function. So what I do is I use the Excel solver function. I solve for the internal rate of return, 8.04%. You're saying, what does it even tell me? In November of 2013, if you bought US stocks, I don't care what you hoped you would make, what you thought you would make, what you prayed you would make. Given what you paid for stocks, you can expect to make 8.04% a year, every year in the long term. That's my expected return on stocks. You subtract out the T-bond rate on that day. The difference is my implied equity risk premium, 5.49%. So November 1st of 2013, if you ask me, what's the equity risk premium for the US? I'm not going to ask people. I'm not going to look backwards. I'm going to look at what people are paying for stocks and say it's about 5.5%. It's implied in stock prices. Will it change on November 2nd? I mean, look at the inputs. What's the input that's most subject to change in all the calculations? So look at this equation of all these inputs. Which one is the one that is most likely to change by a large amount tomorrow? Go ahead, Mark. Mateus. Yeah, interest rates. Rates can change. So that's one. What's the other though? What, what's my, on the left-hand side of the equation? The s and 500, right? Can the S&P 500 change a lot in one day? I mean, what happened yesterday? It was down yeah. 700. I mean, the Dow was down 700 points. The S&P 500 is down about 2%. Every time the index changes, the equity risk premium will change. And that makes sense, right? In fact, yesterday, did the implied equity risk premium go up or down? I mean, the market was down 2%. If, I, if you think about in this equation terms, if I drop the market by 2%, what's going to happen to my equity risk premium? Is it going to go up or down? Well, it's, it's, go ahead, Chandan, I can't hear you. Yes, it will go up. It is going to go up for the same reason when bond prices go down, what happens to interest rates? It's the same kind of relationship. When prices drop, the equity risk premium goes up. It's implied and it's dynamic. And later, I'm going to come back and show you what that number looked like in the first quarter of 2020, what it looked like in the last quarter of 2008, just to show you how much equity risk premiums can change during the crisis. I'm going to skip a page. For some reason, the pages got out of order in the slides. We talk about, hey, how do you come up with an equity risk premium 
for other markets. Because what I've showed you is a way to get two ways, at least, of getting historical risk premiums for the US. You can look backwards in time and you have a lot of history, or you can do this implied premium. What if I asked you for the equity risk premium for Brazil, the equity risk premium for India, or God help you, the equity risk premium for Myanmar? Right? There's not a whole lot of history. Clearly, historical data is not even going to work, right? Because what do we say you need for historical data? A lot of data. I said even 94 years is not enough. There aren't too many markets in the world where you're going to get the kind of historical data you get in the US. He said, what about the implied premium? There's a chance. And one of these days, I might be able to compute implied premiums in India and Indonesia and Brazil. But the biggest input I'm going to have trouble with is that growth over the next five years. Easy to get for the S&P 500, much more difficult to get for the Sensex, the Bovespa, or whatever other index you're looking at. So we're kind of trapped, right? We have an equity risk premium for the US, but we don't have one for Brazil or China or India. And in our case, it's not academic. I have Tata Motors. I have Baidu. I have Vale. I've got to come up with risk premiums in other countries. So I'm going to give you a couple of ways of estimating equity risk premiums. Those of you in my valuation class, I get went through three ways here. I'm going to stick with two. Why, why add confusion to the mix? One is I'm going to cheat. Remember how we cleaned up government bond rates to get to risk free rates? We started the government bond rate, and then we subtracted out the default spread for the country, right? Which we got by either looking at you know, the rating or sovereign CDS spreads. You could actually use those default spreads as your additional risk premiums for a market. You say, what are you talking about? Let's take the 5.49% that I have on the previous page as my base. Let's round it up to five and a half. Why I have this extra decimal? So let's say that's the premium for the US and ask you, what should I use as my premium for India? Well, India in 2013 had a BAA3 rating, and the default spread based on that rating was 2.25%. That's a number I used to clean up the Indian government bond rate. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take the 2.25%, add it to the 5.5% US premium. There's my equity risk premium for India. This is the state of the art, if you can even call it that, of how investment banks come up with equity risk premiums for other countries. They take a US premium, that's a base, and they add to it a default spread, either by looking at the rating or by looking at the sovereign CDS market that we talked about, where you can go in and get a market-based estimate of the spread. So what does that mean? You have a US premium as a base, and if you have countries where you have no default risk, like Brazil, I'm sorry, like Germany or Australia, you go with the US premium, but if you have a country with default risk, you add the default spread for that country to the US premium, and you come up with the risk premium for a country. I'm going to pause there to make sure the mechanics are coming through. So I start with the US premium, and here I've started with the implied premium for the US, and to that I add the default spread. Now do you see why I subtracted the default spread from the government bond rate to get to risk-free rate? Because if I did not do that, think of what I'm doing. I'm leaving the default spread in what I call my risk-free rate by using the government bond rate, and I'm adding it on to the risk premium, which is what many investment banks do. That's a double counting I warned you about. If you do not clean up your government bond rate, you're going to double count country risk. So the first few years I did valuation, I followed the banking approach like the first two years. And then I said, but this doesn't make sense. The default spread I have here is the default spread I charge for buying an Indian government bond, a Brazilian government bond, a Chinese government bond, right? But I'm interested in investing in Indian equities, Chinese equities, Brazilian equities. So let me ask you a generic question. Go with your gut. Are equities generally riskier than government bonds or safer than government bonds? Whatever government you think of in the equities in that market. Are Brazilian equities riskier than Brazilian, the Brazilian government bond? I would think so, right? In addition to all the other worries, you now have worry about getting a residual cash flow. I would expect the additional risk premium to be higher when I'm thinking about equities in a market than the default spread. So here's what I do, and you can take it or leave it. If you don't like it, just stick with the default spread approach. I look up two numbers. Let's take the Bovespa. I look up the standard deviation, or Brazil. Let's take the standard deviation of the Bovespa. It's 
Look up the standard deviation in the Brazilian dollar denominated bond. It's 14%, the government bond. It can be dollar or riyadh, depending on which bond you're looking at. Remember algebra problems from high school? You have a Brazilian government bond with a 14% standard deviation. What are you charging as a default spread? You're charging a 2% default spread for that bond. Now let's assume equities are one and a half times more risky than the bond, 21 divided by 14. The spread you would be charging for equity should be one and a half times 2%, which gives me 3%. So all I'm doing is taking the banking approach, but instead of using the default spread, I'm adjusting the default spread upward for the fact that there's additional risk in equities. So I end up with an 8.5% equity risk premium for Brazil, a 6.94% equity risk premium for China, where the default spread is 0.8%, and a 9.1% equity risk premium for India, all starting with the US premium, but adding an additional amount to reflect the extra risk of equities in that market. It's cheating, I know, because I'm starting with the US premium, I'm using default spread as a measure of country risk, but I can't think of a simple way to get to equity risk premiums without making some choices. Now, this was the page that was earlier in your slides. If you can't find it, it's just four pages earlier. So I'm gonna summarize at least in November of 2013, how I came up with equity risk premiums. For the US, I looked at the historical premium and I said, I'm not using the historical premium. I'm going to go with the implied premium. The historical premium was only 4.2% in November of 2013. I didn't trust it. I didn't trust it because it's noisy, it's backward looking selection bias. And this is a choice I've had to make on every company I've valued over the last 30 years. And every single time I've picked the implied premium. That might be just me, but I just don't trust historical premiums. For emerging markets, for countries which have more risk, I start with the 5.5% in November of 2013. Take the default spread for that country, either from the rating or, so, or the sovereign CDS market, and scale up that default spread for the higher risk that equities in that market have relative to that country bond. So that's what you saw with Brazil, one and a half times mobile. And I do this for every country. So you know what, you know what the world looked like to me in November of 2013? Basically, I started with the US premium, the 5.5%. I got the default spread for every rated country. And in November of 2013, there were about 140 rated countries. I used the rating to come up with the default spread for that country and then adjusted the default spread for the higher risk of equities in that market. Here's the world as I saw it in November of 2013. So let's start easy. US and Canada, 5.5%. You saw the 5.5%, right? That came from the implied premium. You're saying, why is Canada getting the 5.5% too? Not because I'm making some geographical conquest of Canada and saying it's part of the US. Why is Canada getting a 5.5% premium? I started the US premium. Then what do I look at? I look at the country's rating. If it's rated AAA, there is zero default spread. It's rated AAA, I'm going to attach the US premium to it. That's why you see 5.5% for Canada, 5.5% for Sweden, 5.5% for Switzerland, 5.5% for Germany. I'm sorry. 5.5% five and, five and for Australia and 5.5% for Singapore. Every AAA rated country gets 5.5%. He's saying, what about individual countries? Let's take Asia. You know, you look at the range, you can see that the premiums vary. The highest premium in Asia, I think, at that in November of 2013 was Vietnam, 13.75%. I'll give you the updated map in a few minutes so you can see what the world looks like in 2022. So look at these numbers because you want to compare these to what's happened in the in the 10 years since. So I get premiums. So there's India at 9.1%. Vietnam at 13.75%. I also compute a premium for the entire region. You know how I come up with the Asian premium? I could take a simple average, right? Of the premiums of every country. What's wrong with doing that? I'm waiting Vietnam as much as I'm waiting China. I'm waiting what the hundredth largest economy in the world as much as I'm waiting the second. So you know what this premium is by region? It's a weighted average of the premiums of individual countries weighted by their GDP. 
So in Latin America, Brazil is going to have a much bigger weight than Venezuela. So I have premiums by country, premiums by region. I have about 80% of the world covered here. You know who you won't see on this map? Any country without a rating. They're called frontier markets. Why wouldn't a country have a rating? I'll give you a couple of examples of countries without ratings. North Korea doesn't have a rating. Syria doesn't have a rating. You know how Moody's comes up with ratings for countries? They hire an analyst. They ask them to do research on the country. Often you have to travel to the country and talk to the government to see if they can collect data. Can you imagine being hired at Moody's? You walk in excited, first day at work. They say, we have a country for you to rate. Excited, they're going to give you a country. They say, well, tomorrow you're on a flight to North Korea. You probably quit on the spot, right? These markets are called frontier markets for a reason. They're the riskiest parts of the world. Parts of the world that are so risky that people have thrown out their hands and said, we can't do anything. In November of 2013, I did not estimate equity risk premiums for those countries. In January 2023, I do, and I'll show you what I do. But this is the map of global risk, as I saw it in November of 2013. Now, part of you might be saying, why don't you just do India, China, Brazil? I mean, after all, I've com companies in only four countries, you know, the US, why don't you just stop at the four? You know why I need this entire map to get equity risk premiums for my companies? Let's take Disney. Disney is a US company. Does it get all, its, all of its revenues in the US? Obviously not, right? Vale is a Brazilian company, but it's the largest iron ore mining company in the world. It doesn't get all of its revenues in Brazil. So I'm gonna make a statement that I feel very strongly about, though some people disagree. A company's equity risk premium should reflect where it does business not where it's incorporated. Let me repeat that again. A company's equity risk premium should reflect where it does business, not where it's incorporated. Infosys, Indian company, right? But gets 90% of its revenues in the US and North America. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take each of my companies and compute an equity risk premium for that company based on where it does business. So how do you measure? where a company does business. Give me a couple of metrics I can use. What's the most obvious one? What's the one metric that companies systematically in, disclose in their financials? It's the one metric they break down geographically. Geopolitical risk. I'm sorry, what? Geopolitical risk. No, either my sound is acting up, but I, but I, can't, I can't hear what you just said. What did you say? Geopolitical. No, but I'm asking the metric from the company's perspective that they break down geographically, right? It's, you know, they have to tell me something about their operations geographically. What's the one metric you're most likely to see? Revenue by country. Revenue. Revenues oh, are perhaps oh, okay. the only metric you're going to see systematically broken down. A few companies will break down production. They'll say our factories are in these countries. Very spotted. Beyond that, God help you, right? So I'm going to, for, the, for my first drive for Disney, I'm going to take their revenue breakdown. And Disney doesn't break their revenues down by country. Get used to this because on your company, this is my nag in every class, I nag you to see if you picked a company. On your company, assume you picked it, go check the annual report of the 10K or whatever you have, and there should be a revenue breakdown geographically. And many companies will break their revenues down by region rather than by country. Why? Because when I mean, you take Coca-Cola, do you actually want to break down by country? You know how many countries Coca-Cola is in? They break down by region. Disney breaks their revenues down and don't jump on me for the breakdown. This is how they break it down. US and Canada, Europe, Asia Pacific, and Latin America. This is how much of their revenues in November of 2013 came from these four regions. Now take the weighted average of the equity risk. Now do you see why I compute equity risk premiums by region? Because those regional averages are what I'm gonna to use to compute an equity risk premium for Disney. What about the other companies? 
Well, let's take the other companies and let's see what the breakdown looks like. Let's start with the easy one. Bookscape, New York City bookstore. Every person who walks in the bookstore obviously physically walks in. I'm going to use the U.S. equity risk premium. That was easy. You take Vale. You break it down by region or country. Some, they have a mix of regions and countries. Vale is a Brazilian company, right? But in terms of risk exposure, it's really a Chinese company. This is one of the problems when China grew so quickly is many companies, no matter where they're incorporated, became in effect Chinese companies because they got so much of their operations and revenues in China. So there's Wale broken down by region and you can see China is 37% of their revenues, weighted average equity risk premium, 7.38%. Tata Motors, very close. India is 23. Yeah. In fact, today, Tata Motors gets more of its revenues yeah. from China yeah. than it does India. You know that? Yeah. That's what Jag won. Somebody's mic is open. Okay. So when you look at a company, look at the incorporation, but look at where it does business. And you can see that, you know, for all of my companies, Baidu gets almost all of its revenues in China because nobody outside China, I think, uses its search engine. But with every company, I'm taking a weighted average. I want to pause and give people a chance to push back. First, on the notion that equity risk premium should reflect where you do business. And second, on the use of revenues for weighting. Can you think of an example where using revenue weights might give you a misleading sense of country risk exposure? For e-commerce? E-commerce, tell me why, in fact, e-commerce, I would think revenues, in fact, are a very good indicator, right? Because in a sense, e-commerce companies basically connect people and if 70% of your revenues come from Turkey and Turkey goes to hell in a handbasket, your revenues are going to suffer. So e-commerce, I think, is a very good case for using revenues because revenues would capture your exposure. But let me give you a counterexample. When you think of an oil company, Hey, let's say you're a CEO of an oil company. What do you worry about? Where Wait. you're getting your oil from or where you're selling your oil? Selling your oil is selling the global oil market, right? But if all of your oil is coming from Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and Russia, God help you. There's going to be no oil coming out of the ground. So when I look at oil companies, you know how I compute equity risk premiums based on where they get their oil. If you get a chance, you can visit my website. I have an equity risk premium computed for Royal Dutch in 2015, broken down by where. And actually oil companies are very good about where their oil comes from. You can use a weighted average. In fact, I would even split the difference for some companies. If you're tired of motors, you could argue that our factories are all in India. Therefore, I have to worry about India more. I agree. So maybe you'd use both revenues and production as the basis. Go with common sense in terms of weighting. Because the end game here is you want to put yourself in the shoes of the management of the company you're looking at and say, what am I worried about on a daily basis? What keeps me awake at night in terms of country risk? And that's what you're trying to bring in as your weighting mechanism. Professor, could it be yes. something similar for logistics companies? I'm sorry, what? For for logistic companies, could it be yes. something similar? So th let's think through it. For a logistics company, if you think, are, are we talking about a transportation logistics or a storage log logistics? Transportation. Okay, so Obviously. you're a trucking company. And let's say you're, you're geographically, you're already bound, right? You can't be trucking from the US to Europe. You gotta have trucks in Europe, trucks in the US. So if you can get a breakdown of where your trucks are located, you can use that as the basis for equity risk premiums. I'll give you another example. If you're looking at a restaurant chain, you could look at revenues, right? Mm -hmm. But what's the other indicator you can look at? Uh, the number of restaurants. Number of restaurants. So if I, for instance, know that Shake Shack has 81% of its restaurants in the US, 9% in Canada and 10% in Mexico, it doesn't actually have Mexican restaurants yet. I can use those weights as well. 
So be creative. Don't think of what I'm doing as the only, don't work in lockstep. Use common sense. It could be based on production, it could be based on revenues. You're trying to get a measure of where is my risk coming from? Thank you. Uh, professor? Yes. Um, so just out of curiosity, how much does the uh, weight of a country depends if if you have a lot of these projects that has debt to like China and stuff like that, but the company in itself, it's not in China. So a lot of these infrastructure pro projects in like Africa and, and, and South Asia, does that matter? Would you have to take into consideration of China, although China does not have- You know where it should show up? I think it should show up in your cash flows. No, so because not everything that you worry about easily fits into discount rates. So let's say you're a Chinese company, you have all of your infrastructure investments in Africa, and you're worried about the Chinese government doing something capricious. That's one of the things you worry about, right? Because in a sense, as a company operating from China, you say, I am at the mercy of Chinese government rules. If they change them, I'm trapped. So that might be something you bring into your expected cash flows as kind of a reduction in your cash flow saying, I need to set that aside because there is this government effect I've got to bring in. So I think that, you know, it, as I said, there, there, and especially when, when you're in a country where governments can change the rules on you. I mean, let's face it, you're a Russian company getting 90% of your revenues from Europe. You're still trapped as a Russian company, right? Because, you know, the Russian government can effectively say you are equity investors, but today you're no longer equity investing in the company. So in a sense, there is a government effect that's separate from all of the country risk we're talking about, which nationalization risk, you know, special risk, which you might have to bring into your cash flows. Um, yeah, I had a question like, so similar to oil, oil companies, uh, shouldn't mining companies also um, uh, be, you know, like be affected by yeah. any natural resource company, right? Mining, any company where you have zero flexibility in moving your production, the more you can move your production. And that's why I said for Mateo's e-commerce companies, probably the easiest time dealing with country risk. You get worried about a country. Hey, what do you have to do? You've got to put all your software engineers on a couple of planes, fly them across the world to a different part of the world, and you can continue operations. A manufacturing company has a difficult time doing that. A natural resource company has zero chance of doing it. You're trapped in your country. And that's why for natural resource companies, you go based on where your natural resources are because you have no choice. So that's does it mean like for Vale, uh, I mean, uh, this uh, approach can be a bit biased? Yeah, you could, the revenue approach might be biased. For Vale, you could argue that maybe I should be looking at where, you know why I didn't? Because they didn't give the breakdown. You're at the mercy of company disclosure here. And unfortunately, disclosures in Vale were incomplete. So that's why I couldn't even try that approach. But you have a good point with Vale, maybe I should have used where their iron ore is coming from. But unfortunately, they were not forthcoming about that. Well, sorry, going back to the e-commerce, yeah. would, would they also include where they source their, their products from? Yeah, yeah it could be that does, if your production that... is all coming from China. Let's say you're an e-commerce company. You're connecting, you know, this is probably true for a lot of e-commerce yeah. companies in the US. You're selling stuff that is made in China and your customers are all US customers. You are exposed to country risk. So that's a good point with an e-commerce company that's more than an intermediary, where you don't have an easy way of replacing your supply chain. And when people talk about supply chain risk over the last three years, this has become a topic of conversation. That's one of the issues that people worry about. So maybe we need to start thinking more about supply chains when we talk about equity risk premiums and think about reducing our exposure to risk by you know, changing the supply chains. Everything ultimately is a corporate finance decision. So when you, when you work with supply chains, this is one of the things you're trying to bring down or keep under control. Um, yeah. Sorry, I had a question about Apple in that case. Like, would you look at, the revenues or would you look at their supply chain or would you like weigh both you of know, them? It's not an either or. I said, look, you can look at both, right? In a sense, you can say, I'm going to put 70% of my weight in revenues. I'll tell you, here's a simple indicator. The higher your gross margin, the more you should be focused on revenues. Do you see why? Because if it, only 12% of the cost of an iPhone comes from manufacturing. 
And 88% comes from marketing, right places. Revenues matter more than where. If your cost of goods sold is 70% of your revenues, I worry a lot about where you're manufacturing. So it's a very rough indicator. Look at, am I in a business with high gross margins or low gross margins? Which is one reason manufacturing mining companies are kind of trapped because so much of their costs are cost of goods sold. You know? So I think with Apple, you, I'm sure Apple is concerned about their supply chain. But I'm sure yeah. Ford is even more concerned about their supply chain. So going back to that, if it's an oil company, would you mostly look at the inputs in that case? Because Absolutely. I don't know how only large the margins. Because clearly with an oil company, I'm not in the least bit worried about uh, getting the oil out. Look at even Russia with all of its sanctions. Oil has been the easiest commodity to get around the sanctions because all you need to do is offer a small discount and some country will buy it from you. So it's very difficult to get stymied on the revenue side once your oil gets out of the ground. But if you can't get the oil out of the ground, then all bets are off, right? Uh, professor, compared yes. to like natural resources company, how do you think about um, like, you know, you know, companies that deals with, you know, Bitcoins in terms of like their uh, weighted of countries based on the um, equity, uh, equity price weightings? How do you think about that? Or is you said, there any- you said Bitcoin? Or like companies that deals with Bitcoin versus, you know. Like a Coinbase, let's make it specific. You have Coinbase. Yeah. And, you know, how do they make their revenues though? They make it from transactions happening on their platform, right? Correct. They don't, I mean, you don't worry, it's Coinbase. You're not the one who's producing the Bitcoin. You're not the one mining for the Bitcoin. You're a transactions company. So one of the things I'd be careful about in the crypto space is what is your business model for Coinbase? It's transactions. It's more like, you know, Robinhood and, and a brokerage house than it is a crypto company. Same thing with FTX, assuming it had been a legitimate company. It's a storage company, which is more like a bank. So I think with, with the, the space, you've got to be very clear about what part of the space a business is involved in. So unless you're in the mining part of the space, where you're actually the one verifying Bitcoin transactions. I don't see country risk as something that comes from your production. It almost always comes from where your transactions happen. So I told you earlier that one of the nice things about implied equity risk premiums is they're dynamic. You can compute them on a day-to-day -day basis. Most of the time I would not do it, it's torture. But during crisis periods, I've learned that one of the things that helps you keep your sanity is to compute what the equity risk premium is every day. He's saying, how much can it change in a day? But during a crisis, don't even ask that question because the market will answer the question. This was the last quarter of 2008. All of you are too young to remember, but this was the great banking crisis. Started on September 12th of 2008 and then kind of catapulted and drove across the world. I computed the implied equity risk in the green line is the implied equity risk cream day by day, every day from September 12th to December 31st. So let me, let me give you the big picture. We started the crisis with an implied equity risk premium of about 4.4%. So look across, about 4.4%. There was a day in November, this is two and a half months later, where the implied equity risk premium in the US was almost 8%. It almost doubled. This is not supposed to happen in a developed market. This is what terrified people. This is what happens in emerging markets going through meltdowns, happened in the US. It ended the year at about 6.4%. That's an implied equity risk premium during the crisis. What's catapulting it? The fact that the market is imploding and collapsing is pushing up the implied equity risk premiums. This is a more recent crisis, and this one should all be fresh in your memories because some of you were working, some of you might've been in school. This is the implied equity risk premium in the first quarter of 2020. Remember that quarter? On February 14th of 2020. No, we woke up to the news that the Italian government had found 200 cases of COVID on the Italian subcontinent, no, the Italian in Italy, and they couldn't trace it to China or a cruise ship because until then we thought, COVID, cruise ship, China, that's it. None of the rest of us are exposed. And the COVID crisis started. Implied premium that day, February 14th, was 
Six weeks later, March 23rd, the implied premium was 7.8%. The difference is unlike the 2008 crisis, which left lasting damage, the implied premium stayed high. In the 2020 crisis, it went back to what it was before the crisis by September of 20. It was a very, very unusual crisis for markets because of how quickly markets recovered. Uh, historical premium has zero chance of catching this. An implied premium, anytime you have a crisis, you can work through what that crisis is doing to the price of risk in markets. Which brings us to January 1st of 2023. Say, what's the implied premium today? It's easy enough, right? I use exactly the same approach I used in November of 2013. On January 1st of 2023, the implied premium in the US was, uh, the S&P 500 was at 3,840. So let's say you went out and bought the S&P 500. The dividends and buybacks in the trailing 12 months were 182. I'm already going to set you up for something we're going to talk about in more detail when we get to the dividend section of this class. Take a look at the cash flows you'd have received on the S&P 500 companies in the form of dividends, 65.5, in the form of buybacks. In the US, increasingly, two thirds of the cash flows you'd have received in the most recent year came from buybacks, not dividends. We'd have to talk about what it is that's caused the shift to buybacks from dividends and what it means for corporate finance. But you see that shift happening. As in November of 2013, I estimated a growth rate by looking what analysts were projecting. I got cash flows and I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm solving for that discount rate that makes the present value of the cash flows equal to the level of the index. The T-bond rate had risen to 3.88%, so that becomes your growth rate forever. What I get as an, as an IRR is 9.82%. That's incidentally the highest number for the expected return in stocks since pre-2008. We're reverting back to numbers we haven't seen in a long time. If you subtract out the T-bond rate, the implied premium at the start of this year was 5.94%. I mean, just to get a sense of, you know, is that a high number, is that a low? Because even in the two things I've shown you, the premium seems to have shifted. Let me show you what the implied premium has looked like over time. So this is an implied premium graph for the US going back in time. So just to get a measure of 5.94%, where are we relative to what these numbers look like? There's 1960s, the US markets implied premium was between three and three and a half percent. The US equities were the center of the universe. US was this nice, stable, mean reverting market. Then you get to the 70s, something's happening, right? The implied premium is shooting through the roof. Remind me again what happens when implied premiums go up. What happens to stock prices? They're dropping. 1970s, horrifically bad decade for stocks. 1978, the implied premium peaks at about 6.5%. You know what the Dow was trading at in 1978? About 800. There were three numbers in the Dow. Scary thought, right? I mean, that was what now at 26,000. There were three numbers in the dark. Stocks were a terrible place to be. But then we entered one of the great bull markets of all time. You can see the implied premiums drifting down and down and down and down. And they keep going down through the 90s. By the end of 1999, the implied equity risk premium for the US was down to 2%. Do you remember that, that, that test I ran on you on how, many, how much of a premium you demand for investing in stocks last session? You were making 3% risk-free, and then I offered how many of you will invest in stocks if I offer between three and five? Do you remember how many hands went up? Zero. You said, that's too little. But here we are collectively as a market, we're accepting a 2% premium. Saying, what's wrong with people? You know what the definition of a bubble is? is when you tell me you think you can make 10% equity risk premiums, but you price stocks to earn a 2% premium, which is what people were doing at the end of 99. That's a peak of the dot-com bubble. And of course, there's a market correction. There's the dot-com bust. Premiums go back to 4%, stay around 4% for almost five years. Give us false hope that we're now in a period of stability. There's a 2008 crisis. And since 2008, take a look at what's happened to equity risk premiums. They've become higher higher 
and more unstable since 2008. 5.94% is actually towards the higher end of the spectrum. Stocks were priced to earn a much higher premium start of 2023 than they've earned historically. So let me give you my update for equity risk premiums by country in January, 2023. So let me again review the process I'm going to follow. It's going to be very similar to what I did in November of 2013, but there's no harm repeating it again. I start by getting an implied premium for the US. I did this at like 9 a.m. on New Year's Day. Equity risk premium, 5.94%. That's the implied premium you saw on the, a couple of pages ago. Then I go get the ratings for every country that Moody's or S&P rate. In sum, there are 151 countries now for which I can get a sovereign rating. If the more, if the, you know, so if, if one or the other ratings agency doesn't have it, I convert. So basically I have 151 countries with ratings. If the country has a AAA rating, I give it the equity risk premium for the US, 5.94%. If the country is not AAA rated, I get a default spread by either looking at the rating or a sovereign CDS spread. And I cheat because rather than look up the equity volatility and, and bond volatility in every country, which is almost impossible to do for about 120 countries where there are no government bonds, I use one scalar by looking at the standard deviation of an S&P emerging market equity index and dividing by the standard deviation of an S&P emerging market government bond index. That number is 1.41. At least collectively, it looks like equities are 1.41 times more risky than government bonds. I multiply the default spread by 1.41 and I add it to my US equity risk premium. I've got an equity risk premium for every country with a rating. Remember in November of 2013, I threw up my hands on Syria and North Korea and all those other countries without a rating. I no longer do that. And I'll tell you why in a, in a couple of minutes. But here's what I do for them. I look up a country risk score by a service called Political Risk Services. I'll send you the link to the service. It'll cost you to actually pay for the entire scores. I pay for it twice a year to get the entire country risk score. So you can see it on my website. They provide country risk scores for about 170 countries. And the scores go from low to high. Low is very risky, high is very safe. Switzerland was the safest country, according to PRS, in 2022. I think one of the you know Dem Democratic Republic of Congo, one of those, one of the Congos was the most risky country in, in 2022. And they also provide political risk scores for countries like North Korea and Syria, the countries where they don't have a rating. So here's what I do. Let's say the country risk score for Syria is 38. I don't remember what it is, but let's say it's 38. I go look for other countries with risk scores between 35 and 40. I found about five. Three of them had ratings, and I'd estimated equity risk premiums for those three. So you know what I do? I take the average of those three countries, attach it to Syria. And I do this for every one of the frontier markets. I think I've got the whole world nailed down now. This is what the equity risk premiums look like by country at the start of 2023. Again, focus on the 5.94% that came from the US. Every AAA rated country gets 5.94%. But let's go to Asia. Take a look at the spread. Now the riskiest country in Asia is actually Sri Lanka. And if you're wondering why, take a look at what happened to Sri Lanka last year and you're very quickly going to see whether it's the equity risk premium for Sri Lanka is now 26.65%. Think of adding 26.65% to your risk free rate in dollar terms. You're already going to see why nobody's investing in Sri Lanka right now. You're not building a new hotel. You're not starting a seafood business. You just can't make it. There's just too much risk. Safest is Singapore, still AAA rated. But you can see the range. Again, exactly the same approach. And I've got the rating, the country risk premium, and the equity risk premium for every country. There in the top, this box, are those frontier markets. And you can see them, Algeria, Brunei, Gambia, Guinea. So you see the political risk scores, the equity risk premiums and country risk premiums based on other countries with similar scores. You're welcome to use my equity risk premiums. 
Because clearly reproducing this for your company is going to be messy. But one thing I would suggest you do is see this base number of 5.94%. That was from January 1st to 2023. I update that number at the start of every month. Start of February, it was down to 5.54%. Start of March, I will do at the start of March and you will see that updated premium. If you update that premium, all of the other country risk premiums will update for you. So even though you might not have the, 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 the bandwidth to update every country risk premium, if you update the US premium, get, so if you're doing your project in March or April, my recommendation is you go with an updated premium then because God knows what the market will throw at us over the next week and a half, next six weeks. Your job is to stay current, reflect the world you're in, not the wish of the world you wished you were in. So I'm going to assume at this point that you've picked a company that it can go look at its annual report and find where its revenues come from and maybe even look to see where its production comes from or where its supply chain is. It's well worth starting to explore how exposed your company is. And then compute an equity risk premium for your company as a weighted average. And remember, you got to live with the information you're given because companies are not always clear about that information. I'll tell you an example. Many of you working with US companies, here's how they'll break down revenues. They'll say 71% of our revenues come from the US, 29% from, yes, the rest of the world. Come on, guys. The rest of the world is a really big place. But you know what? You have no choice. That's all you're given. You take the 71% in the US, you give it the US equity risk premium. For the rest of the world, I've actually estimated a global equity risk premium. You may say, look, I wish I had more clarity, but I'm going to attach a global equity risk to the 29%. I'll give you another example of what I find frustrating. A lot of European companies, when they break their revenue stock, will have North America, Asia, and EMEA. You know what EMEA is? What goes into your EMEA? Europe. Go ahead, Mateus. What is it? Europe, Middle, Middle East, and Africa. What a nightmare. You bundle those three together. What the heck am I going to do with that? Europe is a relatively safe region. Africa is the riskiest region in the world. You put them into what's wrong with you? Unfortunately, this is all you have, right? So here's what I would do. I take the Europe, the Middle East, and the Africa equity risk premiums that I report. I also report the GDPs for the three. And guess what? Europe is going to be the overall. Don't take the simple average. It's not going to give you a good number. Take a GDP weighted average. It's not your fault that companies don't always break their revenues down in sensible geographies, but work with what you're given. Any questions on equity risk premium? So let's summarize. Equity risk premium is what you demand over and above the risk-free rate. You can get it from surveys. The problem is surveys are backward looking and often don't reflect where you are in the world. You can look at historical premiums. It might work for a country like the, the US in terms of coming up with the number, but it's still backward looking. It's still noisy and still a selection bias. Or maybe I've convinced you to use an implied equity risk premium, a forward-looking dynamic number. The trouble is it's going to keep shifting on you. So if you do your project today in computer cost of equity today, why? Because you're on top of things. You want to get things done as they get done. You might be at a disadvantage from that other person in your group who waits till April, no, forget about April 20, May 6th to do their cost of equity because their cost of equity is going to be updated. So I'm going to give you some advice and you can take it or leave it. I will, if I were you, I would create an input sheet for things like risk-free rates and equity risk premiums that you keep separate from your other spreadsheets that you do. And what you do then is if you're ever asked for a risk-free rate in another spreadsheet, rather than enter it as a hard-coded number, just copy it from your input sheet. That way, every time you change your input sheet, Every single spreadsheet you've done changes automatically. It's a much healthier way to do analyses 
because you hard code numbers, they're hard coded. You have to go replace them by hand or they don't get replaced at all. This way you can update the risk free rate, the equity risk premium and have it flow through your analysis. So no questions on equity risk premiums? Let's move on to estimating betas. At least I'm gonna start on this process. I'm sure in foundations, you at least talked about betas. You were told that a beta comes from a regression. Were you told that? They run a regression of returns on a stock against returns on a market index. The slope of the line is the beta. What a terrible way to think about betas. Because it makes betas into a statistical number. And it tells you that if you run a regression, you got the beta for a company. There's no economic intuition, no levers you can change to make the beta change. But let's go to that regression because there is some advantage to starting with that regression. You know how when you pick a new doctor, they make you go through a whole panel of tests before they even see you. So they go through a blood test because they want to get a, a baseline of what kind of are you, you know, what are the problems I might have to deal with as your doctor? Think of the regression as the equivalent of that set of blood tests. You're getting acquainted with your company. You're trying to figure out, hey, how risky is my company? Where does the risk come from? What should I be thinking about in this company? Well, one thing that you might want to do is run the regression and don't stop just at the slope, which supposedly measures the beta. I'm going to argue that the intercept from that regression is going to tell you something about how good or bad your stock was as an investment over the two or five years of the regression. Let me repeat that again. It's a backward, it's a postmortem of was your stock a good investment? That comes in the intercept. And even the R squared of the regression is going to give you information about what type of risk is your company most exposed to? Micro risk, company specific risk, or is it more macro risk? I know it sounds mysterious for the moment, but let's take a look at a regression. But before we do that, let me at least lay out why the intercept and the R squared are going to give you useful information. So here's what you've done. You've taken returns in your stock and you've regressed it against returns on a market index. You get an intercept from the regression, right from running the regression. It's a statistical output. But what you're trying to estimate is a beta from the CAPM, right? So let's go back to the original CAPM. The return on the stock is the risk-free rate plus beta times RM minus RF. That's your equity risk premium, right? I'm going to do a little algebra. Trust me, I'm not changing the equation. I'm going to move some terms around. So if I take the cap M and move some terms around, I get risk-free times rate times one minus beta plus beta times RM. That's just the cap M. There's my regression equation, intercept plus slope times the RM. Compare those two equations. If my stock did exactly as the cap M predicted over the period, here's what I should expect to see. I should expect to see the intercept be roughly equal to the risk-free rate times one minus beta. In other words, I take a five-year period, I run the regression, that intercept, if my stock did exactly as predicted, should be the, equal to the, inter, the intercept should be equal to the risk-free rate times one minus beta. If my stock did much better than expected, I should expect to see the intercept be higher than my risk-free rate times one minus beta. So if I ran this regression for Tesla over the last five years, I should get a massively positive intercept because over the last five years, stock has been an incredible hit in terms of delivering returns. And if my stock has done much worse than expected, bed, bath and beyond, my intercept should be much lower than the risk-free rate times one minus beta. In fact, the difference between the intercept and risk-free rate times one minus beta is called Jensen's alpha. And it's actually one of the most storied terms in finance. And here's why. This, this, this measure, Jensen's Alpha, was concocted, invented, derived by a gentleman called Michael Jensen, who was teaching finance at the University of Chicago in the 1960s, which is where finance, in a sense, found its roots and grew. And towards the end of the 60s, Michael Jensen was interested in asking and answering a question that everybody seemed to know the answer to, which is, do professionally run mutual funds, how much do they beat the market by? Because the assumption in the late 60s was if you have mutual funds that are run by professionals and they're competing against individual investors, retail investors, these professionals must beat the market because they bring so much more to the table. So you wanted to test this out. At that time, there were about 125 mutual funds. Amazing, right? That's all they were. 
he took the 125 mutual funds and he computed the Jensen's alpha for each fund by looking at the intercept from the regression versus risk-free rate times one minus beta. So if the conventional wisdom was right, what should he have seen as the Jensen's alpha, a big positive number or a big negative number? He expected to see a positive number. He said, hey, these funds must be beating the market by one, two, three percent. And what he found has become one of the most enduring findings in finance. You know what he found is the Jensen's alpha for mutual funds, actively run mutual funds? Minus one and a half percent. He was so shocked. He made his RA run the, the data through. He said, that can't be right. Minus one and a half percent. Active money managers collectively earn about one and a half percent less than the index, at least in the aggregate. That's the story behind Jensen Alpha. But that Jensen Alpha is what we're using to make a judgment in individual companies. Did my company beat the market? So I know it sounds abstract. When we use actual numbers, you'll start to be able to put some flesh behind that number. So let me at least set up the regression. Now, when you open a corporate finance textbook, it says run a regression of returns on your stock against returns in the market index. There are a lot of details that are up to you, right? Like what? First, if I take a stock like Disney, it's been traded for 60 plus years. I can go back and run a regression over the last 65 years. Or I can run it over the last two years. I have a choice of how long, how far back in time do I want to go? And there's a trade-off here. What's the advantage of going back further in time? You get more data, right? What's the disadvantage of going back over the last 65 years if I'm trying to get a beta for Disney today? 65 years ago, what was Disney? Disney was a company that produced one animated movie every two or three years. There was no Disneyland. This was pre-Disneyland, right? Very different company. So when you go back too far in time, you get more data, but you get a very different company than the company you're looking at today. If you don't go back far enough, you don't have enough data. So most services use between two and five years to run the regressions. Two is actually the more common one. If you've had a chance to look at a Bloomberg terminal, if you look at a Bloomberg beta for a company, it's always a two-year beta. Two to five years is the most common choice. So that's the first thing. How far back do I go? Second, you've got to make a decision on how you're going to slice up the data. You're saying, what does that even mean? You take five years, you can look at daily returns, which will give you about 1,230 days. You can look at weekly returns which is about 260 weeks. You can look at monthly returns, which is 60 months. Now by itself, you're saying 1,250 is a much bigger sample than 60. Well, the problem with these daily returns, they tend to be noisy. If there's no trading towards the last two hours of a day, you get strange looking betas. No service, no reputable service uses daily returns to compute betas because they're messy. So almost every service uses either weekly or monthly returns to compute beta. So how far back do you go, weekly or monthly? Bloomberg uses two years of weekly returns. That's a default. So does S&P. You now also have a choice of what index am I going to use as my market, right? It's not like there's one market index. In the US, What's the, when people talk about the market, what is the index that is still the most widely reported index. So when you all, you know, turn on the news and they say the market was down X points today, what's the index they're usually talking about? Anybody? What's the index? S&P 500. I wish it were the S&P 500. It would be more no. sensible. It still is the Dow, right? Because it's been around 150 years. So people talk about them. Yesterday, uh, the, the headline, the Wall Street Journal is market was down 700 points. The S&P, thank God, was not down 700 points. But the Dow was down 700 points. So there's the Dow 30. There's the S&P 500. In fact, does anybody know what 30 stocks go into the Dow 30? God only knows. It's usually very large market cap, but it's a strange system, right? It's, you know, whatever they decide to include or exclude. 
The S&P 500 is much more, there's much more clarity. What goes in the S&P 500? What are the 500 companies? What are the first is market cap. It's the largest market cap. And there's a float requirement. They want you know, this to be a traded company. So it's usually the 500 largest market cap stocks. And when a stock comes in, another stock has to leave. I remember about four years ago when Tesla was added to the index. Somebody had to get kicked out because it's the S&P 500, not the S&P 501 or S&P 505. Then there's the NYSE composite. What goes in that? Anybody know? It's only stocks traded on the New York Stock Exchange. There was a time when that was actually pretty much every big company, right? But if you look at some of the largest companies in the US in terms of market cap, which index are they on? NASDAQ. NASDAQ. Which is, there's a NASDAQ index, which is the which is actually a tech index because it's driven heavily by tech stocks. Do you see where I'm going? If you think about a market index in the US, you have a choice of a hundred different indices. You know the index that most services still use for US stocks. They use the S&P 500. We'll talk about why when we start the next class, but here's what I want you to think about. All of this is in pursuit of the CAPM, right? In the CAPM, what do we all hold? The market portfolio. Oh, yeah. What's in the market portfolio? Every single traded asset in the world. So you want to get as close to that as possible. I want you to think about of all the indices that I've listed, the Dow 30, the S&P 500, the NYSE composite, the NASDAQ, why the S&P 500 ends up being the choice and whether it is in fact the right choice, given that we've all become more global. So next session we start, we're gonna start by setting up the regression for Disney. We're gonna make choices on how far back, we're gonna pick an index. I'm gonna take you through the process of estimating returns on a monthly basis, the mechanics. And then we're gonna run the regression and see what it tells us about Disney as a company. But that's about it. Thank you for hanging in there through that early break, but I'm glad the rest of the session went smoothly, but I'll see you in class. So next class is not a Zoom class. I will see you physically in class next Monday, but have a good rest of the week. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Hey, prof Professor, quick question. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think you said that we're going to answer this in next class, but um, why why do we use the S&P 500 for the equity risk premium and not something like the Russell 2000, which holds like 90 something percent of like equities in the US? The two requirements for a good market index. First, it's got to be market cap weighted because that's what the market portfolio is. Second, it's got to include all stocks in the market. You have a good point about the Russell 5000, though. It is a market cap weighted index. It's 5,000 stocks. Why don't we use it? Because we don't have the history to trust it enough. And that's part of the problem is I think you get very similar betas with the S&P 500 and the Russell 5000. The reason you get away using the S&P 500, it's the 500 largest market cap stocks. So if, in terms of it's about 85% of the way towards the Russell, the remaining 4,500 stocks that you're not including, are such small companies in terms of weight that they don't change the returns that much. So if you get on Yahoo Finance and print out the returns, the percentage returns in the S&P 500, the percentage returns on the Russell 5000, you're gonna see them be very close to each other, even though you'd think that 4,500 additional companies would throw off the difference. Thank you, that makes sense. I think- And in fact, I, I thought you were gonna ask me a question because nothing in the market portfolio says only US traded assets, right? And you're saying, if I'm a global investor, why am I so focused on a US index? And that's one of the questions I want to talk about in the next session is why aren't we using the MSCI? to estimate the beta for every company because every investor has at least a choice of investing anywhere in the world. So lots of choices are made that people don't fully justify. The S&P 500 happens to be one of those.